there are so many times where I was like, I cannot believe the world does not know Manny Ellis' name. I can't believe people are 35 miles away in Seattle shouting George Floyd's name when Manny Ellis died right here. I feel like Manny was targeted. It's like I'm continually reliving this this moment, um, trying to prepare myself it's over and over and over again. It's been three years since Manny Ellis, a 33-year-old Black man, died in Tacoma police custody. Did he do it? What do you think happened? Was he on drugs? Three years since his little sister, Monet Carter-Mixon, decided to figure out what happened to him. She uncovered eyewitness videos. Stop! Oh my God! Stop hitting him! Rallied community support. and help change state law. The office formed the Task Force on Independent Investigations of Police Use of Force following the death of Manuel Ellis. The bill creates a new office to conduct competent, unbiased investigations. I'm signing House Bill 1267. Now, in mid-September, the officers involved will stand trial for murder and manslaughter. I want them to spend their time thinking about what happened and in jail. It's one of the most high-profile cases in Pacific Northwest history. From KNKX and the Seattle Times, this is The Walk Home. I'm KNKX special projects reporter Maya Aina. And on this episode of The Walk Home, we take a look at the upcoming trial. What's at stake? What to expect? and what its impact could be. I'm here with Jared Brown. Jared is a new reporter here at KNKX, but he is not new to this case. His last job was at Tacoma's daily newspaper, the News Tribune. Jared and I will be covering this trial together, along with Seattle Times investigative reporter Patrick Malone. Hi, Jared. Hi, Maya. Okay, let's just quickly go over the basics of what happened and what led up to this trial. On the night of March 3rd, 2020, Manny Ellis, a 33-year-old Black man, was walking home in Tacoma's South End. He was coming back from a nearby 7-Eleven with some powdered donuts and water when he was seen by a pair of Tacoma police officers. The officer said he was messing with the car in the intersection, and they stopped him. When they got closer to him, they said they thought he was on drugs. From there, we still don't know what exactly set it off, but they engaged in a violent struggle. Manny died at that intersection. I'm glossing over a lot there, and we're going to get into it all, but that's the gist of it. This podcast, The Walk Home, explored a lot of details and inconsistencies around what happened that night. And there are still some details we don't know. So let's talk through what happened after the struggle. Jared, can you explain how exactly did these officers end up being charged with murder and manslaughter? Well, it was a really long process. The officers went on and off paid leave, then back on leave again, during the span of effectively three criminal investigations into what happened. And they're still on the department's payroll over two years after being charged. The city of Tacoma has paid them at least a million dollars combined since they went on leave. But I think this might make more sense if we go back to what set the stage for all this complexity, Initiative 940. For more than three decades, Washington had this big barrier to charging police officers for using deadly force. State law said prosecutors had to show the officer acted with malice, meaning some sort of evil or wrongful intentions. Washington was the only state that used language like this, and prosecutors said it made it very difficult to charge a police officer for excessive force. Just imagine trying to prove beyond doubt what someone's inner motivations are. In the time since that law went on the books in 1986, only one officer was charged at the state level for use of force, and he was found not guilty. Then came I-940, a citizen's initiative that aimed to remove the burden of proving evil intent, among other reforms. Almost 60% of voters approved it in 2018, ushering in a lot of new requirements like de-escalation and mental health training, and a duty to give first aid to people they've shot or injured by using force. The biggest win for activists was replacing the evil intent language with a standard that officers acted in good faith 
or reasonably under the circumstances. Another key part of I-940 was the mandate for independent deadly force investigations. Before this, there were a lot of blurred lines because police departments who worked together closely would often end up investigating each other without any sort of firewall. That is, if the department wasn't already investigating its own officers. So how does that apply to the officers in this case? Passing that initiative is arguably what makes this case possible. This is the first time the state attorney general has criminally charged officers for using deadly force. And this is the first case that's going to trial under this new law. So it's not like the attorney general had to bring this case. He could have decided not to, right? But we do know in this era, after I-940 passes, prosecutors don't have to prove evil intent, which was this huge barrier to prosecuting officers before. That's right. And part of the reason the attorney general's office got involved was because of the independent investigation issue. At first, the Pierce County Sheriff's Department was investigating the Tacoma police officers involved in the Ellis case, and they were about to turn over their findings to the county prosecutor's office. But then it turned out a Pierce County Sheriff's Sergeant was at the scene and helped restrain Manny, which created a possible conflict of interest. The county can't investigate because a sheriff's deputy was technically involved. Exactly. So the governor asked the state patrol to step in and for the attorney general's office to review the case for criminal charges. So there are a lot of reasons this case has gotten so much attention. Not only are the allegations against these officers disturbing, and not only was the investigative process really controversial, but this is the first time the state is going to try and hold local police officers criminally accountable. The verdict will likely set the tone for these types of cases moving forward. So if the state doesn't have to worry about proving evil intent... What do they have to prove? So the attorney general is prosecuting three Tacoma police officers. They've all pleaded not guilty, and we've tried to talk with them and their attorneys, but they've said no each time. So let's start with Matthew Collins and Christopher Burbank. Thank you. This is the state of Washington versus Matthew J. Collins. Call Thank number you, Your Honor. Good morning. We're here on the matter of state of Washington versus Christopher Shane <coughs> Burbank. Cause number 21. Collins and Burbank were partners, and they're facing the most serious charges, second-degree murder. Both of them are white and former military. So I rolled my window down and I said, hey, come over here. What's going on? They were the ones who confronted Manny on patrol the night of March 3rd. They say he attacked them. I uh, used my uh, door to actually door check him and hit him with the door to draw his attention away from Officer Collins. They say they thought he was high on drugs. I don't know what's going on, but I think this guy might be excited delirium. Like it was just kind of freakish strength and he just wasn't. But the attorney general's office says they lied about Manny attacking them. They are arguing Collins and Burbank assaulted and restrained Manny without any legal justification. It's, it's just a melee. It's just wild. There's fists flying. Then lied to other officers about what happened and didn't help Manny when he said he couldn't breathe, which ultimately killed him. I, I, I believe he had no pain threshold. It appeared that he wasn't affected by anything. Uh, if they are convicted, the standard sentence for second-degree murder in Washington is about 10 to 18 years for someone with no criminal history. Plus, they couldn't be cops again. And what about the third officer involved? Yeah, Officer Timothy Rankin. Here on State of Washington versus Timothy Eugene Rankin. Cause number He's Asian American and also former military. He responded to the scene as backup. You know, I was, I was thinking the worst um, that Officer Burbank and Officer Collins most likely were either dead or shot. Um, the attorney general charged him with first degree manslaughter. So once I was uh, seated on the subject's back, um, placing my weight, like distributing my weight evenly across his torso. um, They say he killed Manny by continuing to hold him down when he said he couldn't breathe rather than give him first aid. I I remember telling the individual, I was like, if you're talking to me, you can breathe just fine. I was like... The standard sentence for first degree manslaughter is about six to eight years. Manslaughter is also a felony, so Franken couldn't be a cop again. And we should note that the attorney general also charged Collins and Burbank with manslaughter as a lesser alternative to second-degree murder. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to zoom in here on this concept of recklessness, because that's the foundation of these charges, recklessly causing the death of another person. It basically means knowing the risks of your actions and doing it anyway. So that's going to be an important point that the prosecution will have to prove, that these officers knew what they were doing to Manny was dangerous, and they did it anyway. And the state has to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt to 12 people. 
All right, so let's dig into this a little bit and talk about what the prosecution is up against and how they might actually go about doing this. Because none of these charges are particularly easy to prosecute. I mean, they're trying these officers together under this relatively new law, and it seems like there are a lot of potential pitfalls here. And we hear all the time about prosecutors who decide not to press charges, in part because these kinds of cases are so hard. Jared, do you have any insight into why the attorney general even decided to take this case on? Mm, That's another reason this case has been so controversial. The attorney general, Bob Ferguson, has been a leader in police reform, including implementing I-940. And there were a lot of voices in the community calling for the state to step in and investigate. Remember, the medical examiner's homicide ruling came out in early June 2020, days after videos of George Floyd's murder by Minneapolis police sparked nationwide racial justice protests. So there was a lot of public pressure around this during one of the most divisive periods in recent history. On the other hand, the law enforcement community and their supporters have criticized the prosecution as being politically motivated. Attorney General Ferguson is considered a frontrunner in next year's governor's race. He has a lot of critics, and one of the biggest has been Pierce County Sheriff Ed Troyer. The Pierce County Sheriff's Department was the first to investigate Manny's death. Troyer was the one who spoke to the newspaper after Manny died and got on TV when the medical examiner ruled it a homicide. He talked about excited delirium, and he tried to distance the Tacoma officer's actions from what police did in George Floyd's case. Sheriff Troyer and Bob Ferguson also have some history of their own. In 2021, Ferguson's office charged Troyer with a misdemeanor for false 911 reporting in a case involving a black newspaper carrier delivering papers in his neighborhood. In the end, Troyer was acquitted and Ferguson lost. Troyer took a victory lap in the press afterward, accusing Ferguson of unfairly targeting him and painting him as a racist. So there's a lot playing into the perceptions of this case and the people who were involved. So this whole case has been really complicated from the beginning. There's this historical context with I-940, the racial justice context with Floyd protests in 2020, and then there's this law enforcement context where officers feel like they're the ones that are being targeted. On top of all that, there's just the complexity of how this case even unfolded. Manny's death was something that almost no one really even knew about outside of his family until Monet Carter-Mixon, Manny's little sister, started making noise about it. And then there were these three separate investigations, as you mentioned. It took about a year for the attorney general to even bring these charges. And since then, we've been waiting on this trial for two years. Now that we're here, Jared, based on your reporting, what have you gathered about how the prosecution is going to try this case? Well, it's only going to get more complicated. Just the sheer amount of evidence in this case is staggering. There are thousands of pages of documents. The potential number of witnesses is in the hundreds. They've gone through Manny's medical records and the officer's training records, cloned phones. This thing has just completely ballooned. And a big reason for that is because the defendants are police officers. Okay, why is that important? Well, officers have special legal defenses that non-law enforcement like you and me don't have, especially when it comes to killing people. So there's the extra layer of legal arguments, and that's on top of a whole bunch of dueling research around police tactics and tools and how safe they are. Those studies and medical concepts have turned the whole premise of this case, how Manny died, into one of the biggest debates in the trial. But I thought the medical examiner determined that he died from hypoxia due to physical restraint. Basically that the officer suffocated him. Yeah, that's one theory, the prosecution's theory. But if you imagine this trial as filling out a big guilty or not guilty flowchart, imagine this question at the very top. How did Manny die? And everything spirals out from there. To get a conviction, the state has to prove the officer's actions killed Manny. If they can't, then the rest of their case against the officers might not even matter. Hmm. Okay. So what should we understand about the debate over how Manny died? Well, there are two opposing schools of thought around this. The first is this idea of so-called excited delirium. And the second is whether the way police restrained Manny could kill someone. It's sometimes called restraint asphyxia or positional asphyxia. In these sorts of cases, excited delirium tends to exonerate police, while restraint asphyxia tends to implicate them. And they don't necessarily have concrete signs or injuries that you can point to on an autopsy, like a gunshot wound. So they're both viewed as really subjective and controversial. All right, let's start with the second one, the police restraints. Sure. 
There's a lot of debate around police restraining people face down and how that impacts their ability to breathe. The position is called prone restraint, and it's gotten a lot more attention recently as activists and reporters examine past cases of people who have died in that position. George Floyd is one example. Prone restraint usually involves officers putting pressure on someone who is face down in order to handcuff them. It could involve the weight of multiple officers, and sometimes police say they need to maintain pressure to keep someone restrained. So one or more officers holding someone down on the ground to get them into custody. I'm sure I've seen that happen on the street before. It's pretty familiar. Right. And in Manny's case, officers went further and hogtied him. That's when police tie a cord around someone's ankles and clip it behind their back to their handcuffs so that their knees are bent at an angle. Many agencies around the country have had hogtying bans since the mid-90s. I looked into this locally and found the Pierce County Sheriff's Department is one of a handful of departments in Washington that still allows it, although with strict supervision and a requirement to get the person on their side as soon as possible. And it's been banned in some places because people have died from it. Well, again, that's complicated. Okay. Up until recently, the most prominent studies on this type of restraint, hog tying someone, said it didn't really impact a person's ability to breathe, or at least not enough to kill them. These researchers, often testifying on behalf of police, they basically claim it's safe. So hog tying has stuck around in many places. But more recent studies have cast doubt on that thinking. A 2021 study cited by a prosecution expert found that people left in prone restraints with weight on their back after a simulated pursuit couldn't recover their breath and had to work harder to breathe over time. This was just with their hands behind their backs, not hogtied. So the prosecution is going to argue that the struggle between Manny and the officers, plus the pressure of their weight on him, plus the hogtie restraints, plus the spit hood over his head that got coated in blood and mucus, all of that restricted Manny from being able to expand his chest, inhale oxygen, and exhale the carbon dioxide that was building up in his body. They'll argue the officer's restraint is what killed him. Okay, so the prosecutors are painting a pretty violent picture, which lines up with what we know of just how violent that struggle was. Even one of the officers described it as a melee. But the officer's defense team is looking at it a different way, right? So let's go back up the flowchart here and look at the other school of thought on Manny's death, excited delirium. We've talked about this on the podcast before. Excited delirium is what police say happens when someone acts bizarre, paranoid, and violent, seems to have superhuman strength, overheats, and in some cases, suddenly dies, usually because their heart stops. This was actually the very first theory about Manny's cause of death that we heard. It came from the officers themselves. Is this going to be part of the argument from the defense? Yeah, there are several defenses that I think could come up, but excited delirium is a good place to start. Whenever we hear about excited delirium, the scenarios generally involve drugs, mental health issues, and restraint by police. But it's such a buzzword that a lot of people are kind of unsure what it actually means. The medical community on the whole has come to understand that those symptoms, overheating, bizarre, violent behavior, are really signs of other conditions, and it's not accurate to say excited delirium is a diagnosis or a cause of death. The American Medical Association and other organizations have come out against it. Even still, it has a long history in the law enforcement community. And the officers' defense teams are probably going to talk about the training they received to recognize and respond to those symptoms, like putting people on their side to recover. So based off of that explanation, there are a lot of questions around excited delirium as an argument. Is there anything else that the defense might say to shore up their case when it comes to Manny's health and cause of death? I mean, we know that he had a heart condition and he used drugs. Do you think that that will come into play at all? Absolutely. So taken all together from the arguments I've seen so far, the defense is going to argue Manny was having a severe medical episode and would have died whether or not he interacted with the police. They'll lean on the officer's training to say they recognize Manny had symptoms of excited delirium before their struggle. They claim he was sweating and acting strange. Manny's talk screen also came back showing he had enough meth in his system to kill him. So they'll argue it was only a matter of time before the meth in his system combined with his heart condition suddenly stopped his heart and the officers had nothing to do with that. Okay, so on one hand, we have the prosecution that says the officers suffocated Manny to death. And on the other hand, we have the defense that says basically Manny's body would have failed him anyway. Pretty much. So we're going to hear many, many medical experts on both sides giving their opinions on this. I think I counted about a dozen on the witness list so far. But it'll ultimately be up to the jury to decide which theory they believe. 
But I'm sure this is not the only strategy that the defense is going to use during the trial. Jared, how else might these officers defend themselves? Well, we know that another big part of their strategy will be to attack not only the homicide ruling, but also the medical examiner who wrote it. Mm, Thomas Clark. Yeah, the former Pierce County medical examiner. Dr. Clark said Manny's cause of death was hypoxia due to physical restraint, which is the foundation of the prosecution's case. But in the past, in similar cases where someone died in police custody, Clark cited a fatal meth overdose as the cause. So the defense is going to point that out. Mm. Clark addressed this issue somewhat in his initial ruling in Manny's death, that another medical examiner could look at the same set of facts and determine it was a meth overdose that killed him. And before the officers were charged, he told the AG's office they were going to have a tough time proving their case beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's an important thing to understand about a medical examiner's ruling. They use a standard of reasonable medical certainty, which is 51%, or more likely than not. Prosecutors have to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt, 99.999%. Got it. So a medical examiner can't always pinpoint a cause of death beyond a reasonable doubt because in their field, they just need to get to what most likely happened. Right. The defense is also likely to bring up a whistleblower complaint from Clark's second-in-command in in 2019. Her complaint alleged Clark was creating a toxic work environment and also called into question some of his prior rulings. There weren't any findings of wrongdoing, but both Clark and the whistleblower ended up on a list of recurring witnesses with credibility issues. All this matters because Clark is the only medical expert from the state who actually examined Manny's body. So all of the experts are relying on his work to a certain extent, and the defense wants to poison the well, so to speak. Okay, but what about self-defense? What about justifiable use of force? Won't those defenses come up too? Definitely. The officers have argued all along that they were just doing their jobs. And another defense that's likely to come up is shifting blame to other officers. Collins and Burbank had taken their hands off Manny once more police arrived to help. Rankin took charge of restraining Manny at that point, too. And Thomas Clark, the medical examiner, first ruled the spit hood over Manny's head was possibly the most important factor in Manny's death. It was another officer, Armando Farinas, who is not charged, who put the spit hood on Manny. Collins and Burbank's attorneys recently used this logic in a motion to dismiss their charges, but the judge ruled this is up to the jury to untangle. It sounds like the jury is going to have to keep up with a lot of information, not just all the defense strategies, but also the scientific research that will be presented and the intricacies of the different stories each side is going to tell about what happened. Let's talk a bit about the logistics of the trial and how the court is going to manage all of this. Can you share anything about the judge in this case? What do we know about him? Yeah, that's Superior Court Judge Brian Chushkoff. He's been on the bench since 1996, so he's been around the block a few times. He's a very confident, soft-spoken judge, and he runs a tight ship. He said he's going to try and move this long, complicated trial along as fast as possible. Okay. Are there any other key players we should know about? Who's on the defense side? Each of the defense teams has lawyers who have represented police officers before. Jared Osser is a former Pierce County deputy prosecutor who worked with Dr. Clark, and he's representing Collins. And one of Rankin's lawyers is Ann Bremner. She's been a cable TV legal analyst for years and got Pierce County Sheriff Ed Troyer quitted. She really knows how to tell a story to the jury, especially in Pierce County. She's had a lot of success here. And how about the prosecution? Well, the attorney general's office hired two private attorneys to assist as special prosecutors. One of them is former King County Deputy Prosecutor Patty Eakes. She was co-counsel for the prosecution of Gary Bridgeway, the Green River Killer. She's also the special prosecutor in another high-profile case in a different city in Washington, the upcoming murder trial of Auburn police officer Jeffrey Nelson, who was the first officer charged after I-940 changed state law. So she's big time, and some of the best lawyers in the state work at the AG's office. So lots of really strong attorneys on both sides. Okay. So based on your reporting and everything that we've just talked about, what do you think of the prosecution's case? I mean, that's the thing about jury trials. The prosecution has the burden of proof. All the defense team has to do is create just a sliver of doubt in the jurors' minds that maybe the officer's lives were in danger, or maybe it was actually another officer's fault, or maybe Manny did die from an overdose. (laughs) 
So Jared, what happens next? The first thing is jury selection. Two weeks is the long estimate. The court is planning for a pool of around 150 jurors, which is a lot more than usual because of the publicity around this case. The final number will be 16, 12 jurors and four alternates. And then if all goes to plan, attorneys will give their opening statements on October 2nd and will be underway. How long are you expecting this trial to take? I've heard ranges from six to ten more weeks of testimony. Again, we're looking at the potential for over a thousand exhibits and a hundred or more witnesses going before the jury, so I'm betting on the long end. So this trial could go on for three months, maybe more, before it goes to the jury. Jared, thanks so much for talking through all of this with me. Thanks, Maya. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll check in with Manny's mom, his older brother, and his little sister, Monet. Hi, I'm Florina Haladavila with KNKX Public Radio. I'm Jonathan Martin with the Seattle Times. And Jonathan, our newsrooms got to collaborate together a couple years ago on a podcast called Outsiders. It was such a great experience for us, and that's what brought us back here for another collaboration with KNKX. I think it really serves audiences better when newsrooms work together. These collaborations are interesting and fun, but they're complex, which is why we need your support to do more of them. And the way to support future collaborations like this is to donate to KNKX by going to knkx.org. And to donate to the Seattle Times Investigative Journalism Fund at st.news backslash IJF. And thanks. My son would have been 37 years old. On this day, we're talking to Nanny's mom, Marcia, and his brother, Matthew. I miss the the fact of his his warm kisses, you know, and him saying, "Oh, mom, you look so nice." I miss getting together for his birthday. Jared and I actually wanted to talk with them about the upcoming trial. They just finished taking a walkthrough of the courtroom where the trial will happen, and it was a coincidence that their walkthrough landed on Manny's birthday. My thoughts aren't as pleasant as my mom's, but um. Uh, Just a sense of heaviness um, around me. I don't get to say happy birthday to my brother. I miss him heavily. The irony of their walkthrough ahead of the trial happening on this day was apparently lost on the officials who set it up. Well, they basically told us just to be careful what we say, who we talk to, um, you know, keep our opinions to ourselves, and we're going to hear a lot of things that we don't like. I've been asking people involved in this case one way or another, how do you prepare for something like this? What's clear to me from talking with Matthew and Marcia, there is no way to prepare. For Matt, the case has been delayed so many times over the past few years. Part of him is waiting to see if it will actually happen. For Marcia, a creative outlet focusing on painting and crafting has helped. That and leaning on her faith She says there's still room for forgiveness, but forgiveness is different than justice. I want the police officers prosecuted, and I want them to spend their time thinking about what happened and in jail. That's justice for me, because it's not going to bring my son back, you know. I want to see them prosecuted, and I want them to receive time for what they did. We talked about forgiveness and justice and vindication. The truth just needs to come out. There's been so many lies told, um, and I just want want my brother's name cleared. Um, I don't want people to say, oh, he did this, he did that, he deserved this, he deserved that. I want the truth to come out, and we all know that he was just walking home. I walked to the store, walking home from the store, um, and they did what they did, and they need to pay for what they did. Marcia and Matt took that tour of the courthouse. They were the ones who were shown where they can sit, told where the media will be, told where the attorneys, the judge, and the jury will be located. 
Monet Carter Mixon, Manny's little sister, was somewhere else, on her way to the hospital, actually. Monet has had serious complications since giving birth to her seventh child in August, a little boy. The baby's birth didn't go as planned, and she's been dealing with it ever since. Yeah, I honestly don't have a plan because I didn't know that any of the stuff that was that happened to me, like in childbirth, I didn't know like we were almost going to die. At the exact moment when her family will finally get their day in court, the moment when a jury will hear in detail about her brother's final moments, Monet is fighting for her own life. I'm not in the same like mindset I've been in this whole time. So that's like the major issue is like my mental is not in a good space, but then physically like I have to figure out how I'm going to even be able to get to and from court every day without being in pain and needing a walker, needing assistance to walk. So I I don't really, um, I don't know. Jared talked with Monet in between hospital stays to see how she's doing. We knew Monet had been in the hospital for a while, and honestly, we were preparing for the fact that we might not get to talk to her before the trial. Then... Yeah, I don't know. I kind of want to let you take... Out of the blue, on a Friday night, while I was covering another event, she said she could talk. I I don't know what's on your mind. Yeah, I mean, like, it's a lot on my mind, starting to kind of... I don't know if crack is the word to use, but emotionally, I am not doing very well with everything. I hadn't heard Monet sound like that before. Exhausted. Deflated. Monet told me that out of everything that's happened over the last three and a half years, the last few weeks have brought her the closest to her breaking point. She says that within a day of being discharged for the second time, Someone was knocking on her door about a subpoena because defense attorneys are questioning whether the witness video she tracked down was modified. She could have been arrested if she didn't let them clone her cell phone. It makes me really upset because, for one, I just went through something extremely traumatic. And that's like the last thing that I need to worry about. But then for two... I mean, I I didn't commit a crime. I didn't do anything wrong. So to feel like I have to, like, be forced to submit things or give things that I don't really feel are helpful to the case or really even matter, it's just, like, crazy to me because I, I, I really don't have anything to do with this case besides the information that I sought and that I found out and how I advocated for my brother, but that has nothing to do with these officers and them being, like, convicted or or charged and possibly convicted, you know. Monet told me all this feels like a circus, a show that's lost sight of the real people at the heart of it. Manny, he's gone, and this trial won't change that. Her best friend, the one who would help watch her kids and sit with her for Rick and Morty marathons, the one that she would plan a big birthday celebration for this time of year. A recording of his laugh is the best thing she has left to remember him by. I just, like, really wish, I don't know, like, I just, like, really wish that he was here right now. Because a lot of the... <laughs> a lot of the stuff that I've been having to go through and like feeling so alone like when he was here I didn't feel like that I didn't have to worry as much because he like always had my back and was always there for me so like around his birthday like this year is just really really hard because I've had to go through so much So I can't even, like, I don't know, like, I can't even 
it makes me just think about them even more and think about like the situations that I've been in like the past month and just like if he was here like I wouldn't have had to worry about this or I would have been able to talk to him or just something you know like that's all like I just really really miss him right now as much as Monet knows the trial won't change what happened she hopes it can change things for someone else like Manny For the spectators sitting in the courtroom, watching the live stream, or catching up in news reports, she says there's a bigger picture around policing. At the end of the day, this police department specifically is costing taxpayers a lot of fucking money. I hope, if anything, like, you could say you don't like black people or you... You think all lives matter or, you know, you could say it's a political witch hunt, whatever. But I really hope you see exactly what your local government has done. There's so much wrapped up in this case, this trial, the emotions, the political and legal implications, the cost to the community. But when Monet tries to picture the trial, she can't because she could be called as a witness That means she can't watch anything related to the trial until the attorneys are done calling her to testify. The only image I have right now is me sitting, like, outside, not being allowed in the courtroom. Just me sitting outside in the lobby all day, twiddling my thumbs. After all the work she's done to bring attention to what happened to Manny she could be separated from the rest of her family, left waiting in the dark while the truth about her brother finally comes to light. Jared and I, and Patrick Malone of the Seattle Times, will all be covering this trial. You can find the latest updates on the Seattle Times website, and we created a special page for our coverage at knkx.org slash tpdtrial. This episode was reported, written, and produced by me, Maya Aina, and Jared Brown. Our executive producers are Florangela Davila and Jonathan Martin. They edited this episode. We had research help from Miyoko Wolf, and music comes from Marcel E.C. Augustin, Will Jordan, and Quincy Q. Henry. <laughs>